recuse. Uh, this is a long, long time ago. Breathalyzer was the question. And that's about it. Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. I've been doing a lot of work on state Supreme Courts, and you know the Texas Supreme Court is, well, you know this. It's a very good question. Okay. Hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, here we go. Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to James Madison College at Michigan State University. We appreciate our guests here in the room tonight and those who are going to join us online. My name is Cameron Teese and I'm the Dean of James Madison. I would like to start this event with MSU's land acknowledgement. We collectively acknowledge that Michigan State University occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabeg, Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi peoples. In particular, the university resides on land ceded in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. We recognize, support, and advocate for the sovereignty of Michigan's 12 federally recognized Indian nations, for historic indigenous communities in Michigan, and for those who are forcibly removed from their homelands. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold Michigan State University more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator and pal uh, panelists for the Jack Painter Endowed Lecture. The Painter Lecture is a significant event of the college held annually during the spring semester. Many of you knew Jack Painter personally as a colleague and as your professor. We're glad to have professors Emeriti KBC, Dick Zinman, and Ron Dorr with us here this evening. Professor Roger Smith will share remarks about Jack Paint Painter momentarily. I want to thank Peggy Bailey, Jack's widow, and a graduate of JMC's first class for raising the idea of this panel on the US Supreme Court. It's obviously very timely and relevant to the college, our MSU community, and our nation. I appreciate Dick Zinman and Peggy for their assistance in securing a distinguished group of scholars and practitioners to discuss this important topic. And I also want to thank JMC staff members Justin Burkett, Beth Brower, and Rocky Beckett for their work to bring our speakers and you, our guests, together this evening. So it's my honor to introduce this evening's painter lecture panelists. Lee Epstein is the University Professor of Law and Political Science and the Charles L. and Ramona I. Hilliard Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of Southern California. Professor Epstein is also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Academy of Political and Social Science. A recipient of 12 grants from the National F Science Foundation, Epstein has authored or co-authored more than 100 articles and essays and 18 books. She also serves as a principal investigator of the US Supreme Court database. Her empirical research is frequently cited in the New York Times, among other news media. She's received numerous awards for distinguished teaching, mentoring, and scholarship. We're so glad you could join us tonight, Professor Epstein. Welcome to MSU and James Madison College. Our panel moderator, Wallace B. Jefferson, is a partner in Alexander DuBose and Jefferson. Prior to joining the firm in October 2013, he served as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Texas. Appointed to the court in 2001 and named Chief Justice in 2004, Jefferson made Texas judicial history as the court's first African-American justice and Chief Justice. During his time on the bench, Jefferson was elected president of the Conference of Chief Justices and Association of Chief Justices from the 50 states and U.S. territories. As a graduate of the James Madison College and the University of Texas School of Law, Jefferson is the namesake of the Wallace B. Jefferson Middle School in San Antonio. That's pretty awesome, actually. <laughs> You're probably the only one in the room who has a middle school named after you. Um, Chief Justice Jefferson has also received awards for jurisprudence, equity, fairness, and community service. He's admitted to practice in the United States Supreme Court, the Supreme Court of Texas, U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, and the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Welcome back to James Madison and MSU. Our next panelist, Rogers M. Smith, is the Christopher H. Brown Distinguished Emeritus Professor of Political Science at the University of Pennsylvania, where he taught from 2001 to 2022. He is the author or co-author of numerous articles and eight books, including Civic Ideals, Conflicting Visions of Citizenship in U.S. History, which received six Best Book Prizes and was a finalist for the 1988 Pulitzer Prize in History. Smith is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Academy of Political and Social Science, and the American Philosophical Society. He also served as president of the American Political Science Association in 
Professor Smith is also a 1974 graduate of JMC. So welcome back to Case Hall. It hasn't changed at all, has it? <laughs> <laughs> Professor Smith, would you please say a few words about Jack Painter before our panel begins? Well, thank you, Cameron, and I am so glad that you are now among the great deans that James Madison College has had. Can you hear? Can everyone hear? Okay. Speak up a little bit from the back. I should start by acknowledging <laughs> that if Jack Painter had been asked to make a list of his students, my name would probably not have been high on it if it appeared at all. He might have said I was chiefly a student of Dick Zinman, or later, Harvard's Judith Sklar. Yet that in itself is a tribute to what a great teacher Jack Painter was. As is true, I'm sure, for many others, Jack had a far greater and more beneficial impact on my life than he ever realized. I can say that with confidence because when I began preparing for this event, I came to realize that Jack had a far greater and more beneficial impact on my life than I ever realized. Before explaining that, let me note that I attended James Madison College in the early 1970s, a highly turbulent period. We did not worry then that individual shooters would appear on campus killing people at random, as so sadly happened here in February. But anti-war students did occupy administrative buildings every year I was in college. And we worried that the National Guard might shoot student protesters, as happened at Kent State and Jackson State. It was a troubled time for me personally, as I'd grown up a conservative Republican, but the issues of the day led me to question all my beliefs and all my plans for the future. In my second year at Madison, 50 years ago, I took a course Jack taught on legal and political theory. And in it, we read Marbury versus Madison and Munn versus Illinois, along with much else. I knew Marbury versus Madison was the case that had established what we call judicial review, the power of the Supreme Court to declare acts of Congress and other officials unconstitutional. But I was astonished when Jack got us to read it closely, I saw that Chief Justice John Marshall had made many debatable interpretive moves just to get to the question of judicial review. Reading the court's grant of jurisdiction in the Constitution narrowly, reading the grant of jurisdiction in the Congressional Judiciary Act broadly, ignoring half a dozen ways to read the two compatibly, and going on to make one-sided arguments for the court's power at a time when I was wrestling with doubts about the legitimacy of all American institutions, my mind reeled to discover that the case that was the cornerstone of the whole great power of judicial review was so craftily but questionably reasoned. Then I read Munn versus Illinois arising from my home state and saw the Supreme Court explain that the due process clauses were not just about what processes were due, but about the substance of laws. In those days, long before email, Madison College stressed talking with faculty outside of class, and Jack gently helped me see that these decisions had debatable reasoning, but might be seen as attempts at prudential statesmanship. I became fascinated with the politics of American constitutionalism, but more doubtful about my plans to go to law school. Then in another course with Jack, I got very interested in Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments, initially because I liked his name. <laughs> but then, because my doubts extended to my religious beliefs, and Smith's theory of the impartial spectator promised a rational, non-theological basis for morality. Though previously I was often quiet in class, I became obsessed with seeing if this theory could really work, drawing elaborate diagrams of how the impartial spectator's reflections might be shaped depending on which populations the spectator observed and how the spectator's perspective 
might interact with others' perspectives. I'm sure other students quickly grew very tired of me going on about this stuff in class. But Jack was always patient, good-humored, inviting me to come to office hours later <laughs> to go over the diagrams and the issues in more detail. I did, and I was and remain immensely grateful. Later in my final year, when I was deciding whether to go to law school or graduate school, I chatted with Jack, who told me that his own choice had been made when he had some time off in his student days, and he found that even when not required for a class or degree, he chose to read and reflect on issues of political philosophy. So I asked myself if that was true for me. But Jack and I both knew from many earlier discussions that the answer was already clear. So I went on to graduate school, and in a couple of years it came time to choose a thesis topic. And here's what I didn't reflect on until recently. My choice came down to two topics. One was to be a study of the interaction of American political ideologies with the Supreme Court's doctrines over time. The other was to be a study of the relationship of Smith's theory of moral sentiments to his other, much more famous book, The Wealth of Nations. Ultimately, I decided on the first topic because it connected more directly and fully with the issues in American life that most concerned me. But both ideas had their roots in Jack's classes, in Jack's teaching, in the texts he chose, in the ways he made them come alive, and in the thoughtful, supportive, individual attention he gave to me and also to so many others. I am indebted to James Madison College and many great teachers here for helping a young guy who is struggling to find his vocation to arrive at one that I have loved every day of my adult life and one I've tried to pursue in accordance with the very high standards all those teachers set. But it was Jack Painter who sparked the interest that became most central to my work. I wish very much that at some point in later years I'd thought about that and reached out to him and told him that and thanked him for that. So I'm grateful for this chance to tell all of you as part of honoring Jack's memory and his legacy today. Thank you, Rogers, and thank, thanks to all of you for uh, coming to hear uh, this presentation and to honor uh, Professor Painter. Um, I was a student of his myself, um, my, probably my second year here at James Madison College, and he was uh, the epitome of what Rogers just called the high standards of the faculty here at James Madison College. And just looking in this room, I can tell you um, we're in the presence of other great professors, uh, Professor Zinman, uh, Professor C, Professor Dorr, all of whom were also my professors and who um, taught me so, in so many ways um, how to be a good citizen, uh, how to be a good leader, how to listen to arguments and not be afraid of uh, contrary arguments. Uh, and I think this is what uh, Professor Painter, Jack, uh, represented, and I'm so fortunate to have been able to uh, to have been his student. Uh, yes, a middle school named after me is great. Uh, I think that um, my whole progression in public school kind of led me to James Madison College and then my career on the Supreme Court of Texas because I graduated from John Jay High School and then I went to James <laughs> Madison College uh, and then I wound up uh, uh, a Chief Justice uh, like Jay was <laughs> on the Supreme Court of Texas on, in, on the state court system. And so I'm very happy to be here today, and I wouldn't be here but for James Madison College. But I'm just the moderator. Uh, so what I, I want to do is uh, quickly turn to our distinguished uh, professors here who are going to give remarks, uh, opening remarks. Um, I'll ask a few questions along the way, and then we'd love to open it up for discussion uh, from, from all of you. So be thinking as you're listening to these remarks of uh, questions that you might have. This is a perilous time. It's a very interesting and crazy day that we 
have experienced today that are going to lead to more and more uh, decisions, I would think, from the Supreme Court of the United States. And so its centrality to our democracy is um, on, on full display uh, today and, uh, and will be for, uh, for the rest of all of our lives, I would say. So, uh, Lee, why don't we start with your opening remarks, please. Hi, it's an honor to be with you tonight. Uh, is my mic on? Yes? Um, and it's an honor to be on such a distinguished panel with such distinguished alums of this great university. So thank you very much for inviting me. My uh, job tonight is to talk about partisanship. And as you no doubt recognize, the American public is politically divided in more ways than one. First, there's partisan sorting, which is a growing alignment between partisanship and ideological leanings. In the not so distant past, sizable fractions of Republicans were pro-choice, and equally sizable fractions of Democrats had a favorable view of the NRA. No more. Political science research has revealed that Democrats have become more liberal and Republicans more conservative. And this has led to major gaps between the two parties. This graph provides a famous example. It shows the ideological gap, the distance, between the Democratic and Republican parties in the Senate. As you can see, the parties were quite different at the end of Reconstruction. No surprise, but note how polarization began to decline such that by the mid 20th century, the two parties were pretty similar, ideologically speaking. But now look at today's Senate. The gap between the parties has never been wider, indicating extreme sorting. A second type of division is known as effective polarization which is the tendency to dislike and distrust those from the opposing party, a sort of tribalism, us against them mentality. Like partisan sorting, effective polarization too has intensified, influencing American social, economic, and of course, political decisions. Here's a quick example from a survey showing how Republicans and Democrats view one another. Unfavorable ratings have obviously skyrocketed. Indeed, fear and loathing across party lines is now so extreme that when confronted with two policies, say on health care, that are otherwise identical except for the party endorsing them, Americans rate their own party's policy more favorably. Partisan loyalty, in other words, beats out policy considerations. Okay, these are examples from the public and its representatives. Have these indicators of political division hit the courts? Judges say no. Here's Justice Gorsuch. and equally famous, famously, Justice Kagan. But the data say otherwise. The data don't point to law all the way down, but to partisanship all the way down. I'll supply a few examples of partisan sorting and effective polarization on the bench. Starting with partisan sorting, you can actually see this happening on the current Supreme Court, the Roberts Court, before your very eyes. Here, I've ordered the justices from most liberal to most conservative, with the Democratic appointees' names in blue and the Republican appointees' names in red. Note on this, the first version of the Roberts Court, the court was not sorted. On the left are two Republicans, Souter and Stevens. 
Now watch what happens. Robert's two, Robert's three, and by the time we get to Robert's four, when Elena Kagan replaced the remaining liberal Republican, John Paul Stevens, perfect ideological partisan sorting emerges, and this sorting persists today. Almost needless to say, this is no trivial matter because the sorting manifests itself in the court's decisions. Here, I've graphed the percentage of liberal votes in non-unanimous decisions cast by the Republican and Democratic appointees. There's almost always a gap between the two, with the Democrats usually casting more liberal votes, but the gap is clearly growing. A five percentage point gap during the Warren court years, with the Republicans voting 60% liberal, and the Democrats 65% liberal. Today, in the Roberts Court, that cap is four times that at 21 percentage points between the Democratic and Republican justices. Also worth pointing out is that partisan sorting is all the way down in a different sense. A growing gap has emerged between Democratic and Republican appointees on the U.S. Courts of Appeals. These data from appellate court decisions are limited and preliminary, but they too show an accelerated divide on liberal voting from 12 percentage points between Democratic and Republican appointees at the start of the data run to more than double that in 2020, and that gap may be even wider today. Turning to effective polarization, there are certainly stories and some anecdotal evidence of us against them behavior on the courts. Snarky comments by judges about opposing partisan politicians, lectures by judges that seem more like fiery political speeches, and on and on. But there's data too. Here's just a bit from the justices voting for the president in high stakes disputes when the president is of the same political party as the justice and when the president is of a different political party. Note that the gray bars are always higher than the black bars, indicating that justices tend to favor co-partisan presidents. That is, Republican appointees tend to favor Republican presidents and vice versa for Democratic appointees. But again, the gap has grown so wide from two percentage points during the Warren Court to 29 percentage points today, indicating more and more antipathy toward opposite partisan presidents, or if you prefer, favoritism toward co-partisan. Let me give you just one more example of us against them judging. This one, from the court's emergency application docket, pejoratively known as the shadow docket, which you've been probably reading a lot about. On this docket are applications that may require prompt attention. For example, an application filed by a death row inmate who is scheduled to be executed, or by workers who generally must be vaccinated to keep their job. There has been much criticism of the court's ruling on emergency applications in recent years, especially from liberal commentators. Because it seems that many emergency rulings have favored conservative causes, liberals have decried the emergency docket as a dangerous, politically expedient tool that the court's conservative Republican majority has exploited to advance its own ideological and partisan commitments. Well, yes, it's true that the court's Republicans have favored conservative slash Republican causes. This graph shows the percentage of votes cast by each justice to grant relief based on the application's partisan slash ideological leanings. Start with the panel on the left. As you can see, 
the extreme Republican appointees, Justices Thomas, Alito, and Gorsuch, frequently vote for Grant when the applicant is advocating positions high on the conservative Republican agenda, such as favoring electoral maps that advantage the Republican Party or permitting regulations on abortion. And those three justices almost never vote for a leaf when the applicant advances Democratic liberal positions. Look at Justice Thomas, 75% grant rate versus 5% grant rate. So the commentators have a point. It's not a leap to conclude that conservative Republican causes and interest, when those interests apply for emergency relief, have a good shot at receiving the votes of these justices. This seems to be a quintessential example of us against them judging. What the commentators miss, of course, is that effective polarization isn't limited to the Republican appointees. It's an issue for the Democrats too. The gap is narrower, but it's still true that Justice Sotomayor, for example, supported liberal causes in 35% of the applications, but only 4% for conservative applicants, a 31 percentage point difference. That too is favoritism to the home team and seeming hostility towards the opposite side. From a social science perspective, these sorts of partisan trends haven't gone unnoticed. Scholars tell us that they are partially responsible for the historically low level of public confidence in the Supreme Court, from 50% 20 years ago to 25% in 2022. Okay, all the data I've presented are about today. What about the future? Is the present the future? Well, that's a little like asking for how much longer will political polarization abuse American society? And unfortunately, because social scientists and historians can't pinpoint the causes, it's hard to come up with answers and ultimately solutions. But at least for the federal courts, this much seems clear. Short-term relief from the political branches is unlikely, especially without the filibuster for judicial nominees. To see why, consider the current Supreme Court, again ordered from most liberal to most conservative, but this time showing the ideological spaces between the judges. Now suppose that Biden wins in 2024, but that the Democrats lose the Senate, a seemingly plausible scenario. Were one of these justices to leave the court, what's the incentive for Senate Republicans to confirm any Biden nominee? Probably not much, so it's likely vacancies could start piling up. Now imagine that the president and Senate are of the same political party. What's the incentive for a president to nominate a more moderate member of his party, a Byron White, an Anthony Kennedy, a Sandra Day O'Connor? Without the filibuster, not much. So either way, unified or divided government, elected actors probably will only aid and abet in perpetuating partisan sorting and effective polarization. Unless, unless change comes from the courts themselves. Imagine a Supreme Court that stayed away from hot button issues like abortion and affirmative action and has spent a year or two or three resolving circuit split, splits in statutory interpretation cases the kinds of disputes on which the justices seem to work together as a court and not as members of a political team. Perhaps then they could not only depolarize, but maybe, just maybe, regain the public's confidence. Thank you, I look forward to the discussion. Rogers, you're next. 
It's an honor and a thrill to be back at James Madison in the incredibly accomplished company of Professor Lee Epstein and former Texas Chief Justice Wallace Jefferson. <clears throat> Lee is the nation's most distinguished empirical scholar of the Supreme Court. And I am in full agreement with her characterizations of the judicial behavior of its current members. My own work, beginning here at Madison, is grounded in the history of ideas. And in my talk, I hope to complement her presentation by discussing the political and jurisprudential developments that help explain why the court has taken such a militantly conservative turn, swerving further away from the center of American public opinion than at any point in many decades. Though it's necessarily an oversimplification, I suggest this shift is deeply rooted in what my former graduate school classmate Charles Kessler, now editor of the Claremont Review, has called the crisis of the two constitutions. <clears throat> Charles and I disagree strongly on many things, but we concur in seeing the progressive era as a hinge period in American political development. It was a time when severe political and philosophical objections to prevailing understandings of American constitutionalism gave rise to a family of new visions of American constitutional governance that have contested, though also sometimes blended, with older constitutional conceptions ever since. For simplicity, it's convenient to contrast, as Charles does, the first ah, traditional American constitution with the second progressive constitution, though there are in fact many variations in each camp. But painting broadly, the traditional constitution saw the constitution's goals and structures as grounded on beliefs in unchanging natural rights and natural law, discernible through enlightenment rationalist philosophy, <clears throat> and thought to be consistent with divine law as revealed by true religion, generally felt to be forms of Protestant Christianity. The Enlightenment's new science of politics, as supposedly perfected in America, presented a large-scale federal system of representative indirect popular self-governance <clears throat> as the best way to achieve a more perfect union while preserving legitimate diversity, and the best way to help ensure that the reason, not the passions, of the people governed. The Constitution's rights were particularly favorable to private property, commercial market systems, and scientific innovations, and its framers quietly glossed over the protection it gave to enslaved labor systems and to local and state decisions to deny full rights to the majority of their residents. By the progressive era, that constitutional system had helped generate enormous economic growth and technological progress, but also skyrocketing economic inequalities, brutal poverty, as well as searing intellectual doubts about earlier forms of rationalism and religiosity, doubts which mounted after a massive civil war over slavery that fostered expanded, if still intensely contested, notions of who could claim full citizenship rights. In this political and intellectual context, progressives subjected the original Constitution to scathing critiques and began developing their visions of a rival progressive constitution. Most progressives rejected beliefs in unchanging natural laws and natural rights, and instead saw rights as alterable political creations that should be structured <coughs> and restructured to provide for the general welfare in the here and now. They legitimated American governments not, governance not in terms of a higher law of reason or religion, but in terms of whether the government was meeting current popular wants and needs and doing so efficiently because its programs were designed and administered by modern experts. The progressives despised how courts were striking down what they saw as necessary, democratically authorized regulatory laws in favor of what the judges presented as the unchanging meaning of the Constitution. Instead, the progressives embraced forms of living constitutionalism, holding that legislatures, executives, and courts were entitled to interpret the law in light of current knowledge, current needs, and current values. They favored minimizing the traditional tripart separation of powers by giving most power to democratically elected officials 
<coughs> and legislatures and their expert advisors, regulators, and administrators, with only a minor role for the courts. And over time, they increasingly favored national power over state and local power, as well as far more inclusive, egalitarian conceptions of citizenship. Though all too many early 20th century progressives thought modern science justified eugenics, segregation, and imperialism. This progressive constitutionalism also had internal jurisprudential problems. Most of all, the problem of distinguishing living constitutionalism as a guide to the American ship of state, distinct from simply saying, anything goes. Early Americans pioneered the creation of written constitutions in order both to empower and to constrain their governments, enabling them to do their legitimate work, but preventing them from acting lawlessly and tyrannically. But if everyone is entitled to read the Constitution as endorsing whatever the current popular preferences and expert opinions say, it's hard to see how any constraints remain or what the point of having a written Constitution is in the first place. By the mid 20th century, Leading American lawyers developed highly influential answers to this jurisprudential difficulty. As Emily Regeer shows in a dissertation she's currently completing at the University of Pennsylvania, the Legal Process School, led by Henry Hart and Albert Sachs at Harvard, built on the works of the legal philosopher Lon Fuller and the democratic philosopher John Dewey to argue that judges should be guided and constrained by the law but they should focus on discerning the law's enacted purposes and on considering how cases could be decided so those purposes would be fulfilled. In figuring out just what rulings would actually enable laws to achieve their purposes, judges could and should take modern conditions, expertise, and current widely shared understandings of those purposes into, into account engaging in what they called reasoned elaboration of the law's goals. But if there were no widely shared understandings of those purposes, or if expert judgments were divided, if which, what judges saw instead were major disagreements about the law's purposes and how to fulfill them, legal process theory said judges were supposed to defer to democratically elected officials, to legislatures and executives and their experts. The great model of this sort of judge was former Harvard Law professor, then Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter. And for a time in the 1950s, he was perhaps the most influential justice on the court. But in the 1960s, Frankfurt lost, Frankfurter lost influence due to developments that would over the next half century bring the adherents of the two constitutions into sharper, ever more polarized opposition. Under the leadership of the California progressive Republican, Earl Warren, the court abandoned deference to elected officials at all levels whenever its members judge voting systems and laws to be biased against racial, ethnic, and religious minorities. In so doing, the Warren court justices believed that they were expressing values that were now coming to be widely shared, at least among what they saw as the country's more moral and responsible citizens. Conservative opposition to the Warren Court's activism and to related legislative and executive initiatives of the 1960s contributed over time to the rise of the Reagan Coalition that won in 1980 and predominated in American politics for the next quarter century. The Reagan Revolution included elaboration of a reinvigorated conservative jurisprudence energetically promulgated by Reagan's Attorney General Edwin Meese who argued that courts were empowered to enforce only the original meanings of constitutional texts, which conservatives eventually decided were the meanings that would have been commonly understood when the texts were enacted. Reagan appointee Justice Antonin Scalia, an ardent originalist, liked to argue that he therefore preferred his constitution not living, but good and dead. And in this era, traditional constitutionalism and progressive constitutionalism became much more sorted into the two major parties in the ways 
that Lee has described. But this revived conservative constitutionalism faced its own jurisprudential difficulties. In particular, given the vast array of precedents and laws expressing evolving, progressing, living constitutional views that judges, legislatures, and executives had built up through the 20th century, the question arose, how far should conservative judges go in trying to restore the original or traditional constitution? Overturning lots of precedents and laws seemed much more activist than conservative. The answer for many years when the politically savvy Sandra Day O'Connor was the swing justice on a closely divided court was for the court to make largely incremental changes that moved overall in a more conservative direction. Though O'Connor, the first female justice, did seek to advance gender equality and to sustain more limited abortion rights. After her retirement in 2006, Anthony Kennedy became the swing justice. Appointed by Reagan after the Senate rejected a leading originalist, Robert Bork, Kennedy was a libertarian-minded conservative who openly embraced living constitutionalism to uphold gay rights, and he also supported limited abortion rights. Aghast at his rulings, many other conservatives became convinced that they needed to push even harder for truly originalist judges, especially anti-abortion ones. But after Kennedy's retirement in 2018, the swing justice was briefly Chief Justice John Roberts, who, while very much a traditional conservative, is also an institutionalist, very conscious of his responsibility as Chief Justice to keep the court widely respected and supported. Up through 2020, he led the court to stay largely in line with American public opinion on most major constitutional issues. Then, however, Justice Ruth Ginsburg died and President Trump was able to make his third appointment and create a super majority of conservatives, which has not been altered by the recent replacement of Justice Stephen Breyer with Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson. This super majority means much less power for Chief Justice Roberts or any swing justice. Now, the most striking fact about the current court is that as a result of the conservative focus on overturning Roe v. Wade, it is an overwhelmingly Catholic court. Seven of the nine justices were raised Catholic or converted to Catholicism. Six of the nine justices attended Catholic high schools, 67% in a country where less than 5% of Americans attend Catholic high schools. It's not surprising that this court overturned Roe v. Wade in the recent Dobbs decision and related to that ruling, which shows deference to restrictive laws enacted partly on the basis of conservative religious beliefs, the area where the court is now most aggressively overturning precedents is in cases involving religious liberty claims of primarily more traditionalist religious believers. Reagan's Chief Justice William Rehnquist, for example, thought in Locke v. Davey in 2004 that states should have a choice about whether they also wanted to fund students pursuing religious studies when they were funding students in secular majors. But now the court in Carson versus Macon has said that if states are providing tuition for secular private schools, they must provide tuition for accredited religious ones. The supermajority appears to see in the Constitution a duty to aid and accommodate religious groups as many 19th century exponents of more traditional forms of constitutionalism, <clears throat> like Justice Joseph's story, suggested. So the question now is, how far will the current supermajority go in overturning precedents and perhaps seeking to restore what its members see as the original traditional constitution in terms of basic liberties, the structures of power, and the fundamental goals of American constitutionalism? The possibility of large numbers of intensely controversial overturnings is real because, as Lee indicated, in our current polarized political environment, many proponents of both traditional conservative constitutionalism and progressive living constitutionalism now see their opponents not just as wrong, but as consciously and maliciously evil. And many conservatives, including some on the court,
believe that the politically cautious incrementalism and institutionalism of O'Connor and Roberts failed to make a significant dent in what they see as the illegitimate embrace of living constitutionalism by the court in the country during much of the last 100 years. So it's likely that in the years immediately ahead, we will see the court much more willing to overturn many precedents and laws dating back to the New Deal than the court was when O'Connor and Roberts were the swing justices. At the same time, there are reasons to think that the future may not display as much upheaval and division as many now understandably fear. For one thing, many progressives who are heirs of legal process jurisprudence do recognize an obligation to uphold what can reasonably be seen as the law's purposes, not their own. While many conservatives do still maintain respect for precedent. As a result, the reality is, as this slide shows, even on the current court, many cases are decided unanimously or near unanimously. Leave gave evidence on the non-unanimous cases. Many cases are decided unanimously despite the fact that no case gets to the Supreme Court without some credible arguments on each side. It's also true that, again, there are different versions of liberal and conservative constitutionalism that make it hard for either side always to have a united front. And let me add one more often neglected point. Our constitutional text today is itself a hybrid of more traditional and more progressive constitutional conceptions. Of our 27 amendments, 13 were added from the progressive era to the present beginning with four in the progressive era itself. Most of these modern amendments, which include powers for progressive income taxes, direct election of senators, abolition of poll taxes, and voting rights for women and 18-year-olds, express aspects of progressive constitutional outlooks, especially as those views have evolved to embrace full citizenship with equal political rights for all Americans, for women, for racial minorities and the poor, and for younger Americans. Consequently, I believe that the task of honest constitutional interpretation today is not one of taking sides on behalf of either the traditional constitution, however understood, or progressive living constitutionalism, however understood. It is one of finding as much common ground as we can amidst our diverse constitutional understandings, since all have some real expression in the text of our constitution. I believe that as the rate of near-unanimous Supreme Court decisions shows, there is much common ground to be found if we decide we really want to try to reach it. And most often, it's the high ground. I also believe with the legal process theorists, but also with many originalists, that when justices cannot honestly discern any constitutional common ground, the appropriate course for them is to leave decisions to democratic self-governance, to the judgments of we, the people of the United States. The Supreme Court has its role, to be sure, but fundamentally, both the traditional Constitution and the progressive living Constitution seek to foster effective popular self-governance, not government by judiciary. That means that in the end, it's up to all of us to see that our current constitutional divisions do not prove to be sources of crisis and destruction. Rather than doubling down on those divisions, or despairing of them, our role as citizens must be to take them as spurs to thinking creatively and cooperatively about how we can together form a more perfect union. Whether we will do so, not what the court will do, is in my view the central question facing American constitutionalism today. Thank you. Well, there's a lot out there for us to discuss, and I want to begin um, with Lee and her scholarship on a partisan sorting. Uh, and I want to pose this question to her, and the context is uh, that maybe there's a, a, a third way where partisanship is not really the issue, and this will lead into some of your uh, remarks as well, Rogers, and that is what about the lawyer or advocate who thinks that Marbury versus Madison got it wrong uh, completely, that there is no uh, judicial supremacy, 
that you can derive from the United States Constitution and that the court has been going in the wrong direction for decades now, both under liberal and under conservative. So this, uh, this idea would say that Shelby versus Holder was wrong and a conservative uh, lawyer has made that point. Or Citizens United, the Supreme Court didn't have authority to say that. Nowhere is that in the Constitution. And this is one of the architects of the destruction of the Dobbs case itself, a lawyer named Jonathan Mitchell, who was formerly a solicitor general uh, in Texas uh, and was the author of legislation, Senate Bill 8 in Texas, that made bounty hunters out of citizens going after those who would advocate for uh, reproductive rights. Um, and so isn't that a different way to look at this? And what happens if that sort of thinking uh, becomes the norm at the Supreme Court? Well, the first thing I will say is that um, based on Roger's presentation, or look at my data, uh, there are five justices on the court who aren't going to go for that. They love it. They're happy striking down things right and left um, to get back to the, the traditional Constitution that Rogers talked about. So I think as a practical matter, isn't going to happen. Maybe in a time where the court was more evenly divided or one side wasn't going to have its way, possibly. But I actually think that position of sort of, let's get rid of judicial review, uh, the Supreme Court no, no, no longer has the power to invalidate laws. It's getting really close to Felix Frankfurter. It's getting close to the idea that let the democratic process decide. But there's, there's one minor problem with it. And um, I, I'm not sure you mentioned this with regard to, to Frankfurter and judicial self-restraint. Judicial self-restraint depends on the democratic process working. You know, so if you go back to the Warren Court, for people, I, I think like myself, who believe in judicial self-restraint, we need the channels of voting open. We need participation open. We need speech open, or else we have a broken democratic process, and then we need the court. So, um, so you know, I, I do think the end of Marbury probably wouldn't be the end of the world if we had democratic processes that worked. There are some uh, debatable reasoning in Marbury versus Madison. Um, what about the end of Marbury and the end of judicial supremacy? What do you think about that? Well, first I note that you can read uh, Marbury as um, not a full-throated proclamation for judicial supremacy. Um, and of course, the Supreme Court didn't overturn another congressional law um, in Marshall's tenure. Um, it didn't happen again until uh, the infamous uh, Dred Scott decision in 1857. The um, opinion can be read to say that yes, the court can decide constitutionality in cases that properly come before it, and people should honor its results in that particular case. But the other branches of government and citizens are not obliged to take the court's ruling on constitutionality <coughs> as the definition of uh, the Constitution that should prevail in uh, their own uh, further political decision making. This is the position taken by many American presidents, uh, including Abraham Lincoln in his um, response to Dred Scott. It's in reality uh, what we've done empirically throughout our history since Congress regularly in the states pass laws that push the court to reconsider decisions. We couldn't have had the Dobbs decision if the states weren't passing laws to require the court to question uh, the ruling in Roe v. Wade on the meaning of the Constitution. Um, and uh, uh, I agree uh, with Lee entirely that where Felix Frankfurter went astray and discredited his own position is that he called for judicial restraint to democratic processes <coughs> when the process were, processes were clearly not democratic and they were blocked in ways uh, that um, could only be remedied by uh, judicial intervention. Uh, and uh, discrediting his restraint there helped discredit it more broadly, I'm afraid, uh, 
I do think that if uh, exercising democratic processes, um, we play a stronger role in uh, saying how we the people think the Constitution should be understood, uh, the court might um, at some point, not in the near future, but might at some point come to adopt a more restrained posture again, and I think that would be better for constitutional democracy. So um, in the near future, in the concurrence in the Dobbs case, Justice Thomas um, mentioned a number of other decisions that um, should be vulnerable uh, based on the reasoning in Dobbs and his overall judicial philosophy, cases like Griswold. Some people put Loving versus Virginia on that list and others. What do you think the, the, uh, with this current makeup of the Supreme Court, the prospects for a further conservative or right word or correction in their mind might uh, come about? I hope and believe that uh, uh, Justice Thomas um, is uh, joined in these views, um, uh, maybe only uh, by Justice Alito, Justice Alito and Barrett at um, uh, the most. Um, uh, the uh, reality is, well, and I very much doubt that he'll uh, push for overturning Loving versus uh, Virginia. Um, uh, Perspective, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> if personal factors have any role in his uh, uh, contact, uh, conduct. But um, uh, uh, Neil Gorsuch has uh, already shown himself uh, to be someone uh, who was uh, willing to read the text of the 1964 Civil Rights Act as um, providing protection uh, to LGBTQ plus Americans in a way that um, many conservatives criticized. Um, uh, Chief Justice Roberts, uh, uh, we hear, uh, wanted a more moderate opinion in the Dobbs decision. I don't think he wants to overturn um, major precedents of that sort. And so I don't see that the conservative supermajority is cohesive enough on the things that Justice Thomas was talking about to get to five votes on those. Uh, but I also defer to Lee, who follows the court much more closely than I do. And I would like you to answer that as well. well. And then also talk about the role the Federalist Society has played in shaping the direction of the court. Yeah, I, I, I think I agree with Rogers. The, the conservative side of the court is divided on, I'll just call it foundational privacy issues. I'm not so sure they're divided on constitutional issues related to LGBTQ+. And um, a number of the justices have pushed in that direction. So I think if anything starts to unravel from Dobbs, it would be like Obergefell. And you know, it's hard to imagine them going back on Obergefell, but it's imaginable. I, I want to. I actually want to ask a question. Can I ask? Oh yeah. So, I teach constitutional law to first-year law students. And um, it's a course on structural constitutional law, meaning that we focus on the branches of the federal government and federalism. And virtually every topic I've taught this year, I've used words I've never used before, which is, yeah, that's been around since the 1930s, but you know, tomorrow we could wake up and that would be gone. And I've said that so many times about so many areas of the law that we have a court, I would say, that many of the justices on the court disrespect precedent. They don't think it's relevant to their decision making. So here's the question. Can you have a common law court that thinks precedent is irrelevant? I don't know you would call it a common law court under those circumstances. What do we call it? Mm -hmm. I fear a partisan sounding label, so I will. Uh, I do think it's a, uh, this court would claim to be it's an originalist court. So. Chief, what do you, uh, can I ask you what you think about that? So I think that is a, a very central question and essential question. And I'll just tell you from my perspective. Um, you know, I practiced law for 13 years before I was uh, appointed to the court in 2001. 
and so I had all these ideas about where the law should be, and, and uh, some of it uh, came from here, some from law school, some from the clients I represented, and then I came to the court, and the question was, what do you do with this? Do I, you know, I have the ability with one vote, if I can get four others, to change the law in, in, a, in a different direction. And I guess I put myself in the, in the institutionalist camp of John Roberts, that that's not uh, what a judge is there to do. Um, and we're, <laughs> I'm only going to be there for so long. Um, and, and so, you know, what the role, the role of stability in the law is important. Uh, there are reliance interests uh, that really um, need to be respected, and I think that's part and parcel of stare decisis. And you look to see whether the law has um, evolved in a way that is crippling society or denigrating rights. Maybe in those areas that you would consider it's time to look at, at, at changing. But otherwise, um, I guess I'm a conservative at heart uh, in, in that I would, uh, but you don't see that uh, on, in every member of the court. And the reason I ask about uh, the Federalist Society um, is that, you know, today you have lawyers and judges uh, that essentially are campaigning uh, for higher judicial office, um, either a circuit position or the U.S. Supreme Court. And the way they campaign is the way they write, you know, in concurrences or dissents, or if they can gather a majority uh, that gets the attention of, these days it's somebody, it, it's either Donald Trump or somebody like Donald Trump or in that same vein that might uh, propel them to the Supreme Court. And, I, and my own view is that's somewhat dangerous. Rogers, what do you think? Well, um, I do think uh, that if one values stability in the law, uh, the kind of institutionalist approach uh, you describe is um, uh, the correct one. And uh, if, uh, and I also think that it is a byproduct of the um, intense politicization of the courts uh, that we have more campaigning for higher judicial office through opinions as you um, described so well, um, uh, how much, to come back to your question about the Federalist Society, it has contributed to that. Um, uh, hard for me to judge. Uh, I have known lots of um, uh, students, I knew the students that helped found the Federalist Society and many involved with it since. <coughs> and it's true that for some, uh, it is essentially uh, an arena for intellectually stimulating conversations among conservatives, uh, but for others, it is a grooming and recommending venue, um, and it's been remarkably uh, successful uh, in the last uh, couple of decades in shaping who Republicans nominate to courts. There's um, a, a fortuity, um, uh, and I don't mean that necessarily in, in a positive sense, in the makeup of the Supreme Court today, there are deaths, right? Uh, there are, as you mentioned, um, uh, the, the Senate in certain hands, um, and once they become empowered, maybe they deny votes to others. Are there structural reforms uh, that would answer some of these uh, fortuity, fortuitous problems, if, if you consider them to be problems? And if so, what, would those, what might those be? Well, you know, uh, there's been a lot of focus on the justices, you know, term limits for the justices and take, taking away jurisdiction, taking away their ability to select cases, just make them decide 6,000 cases a year. There's been all kinds of proposals. Um, none of them will pass. Most of them require constitutional amendments, um, but just for the, for the fun of it, the sport of it, I would say based on the political science research, there is one proposal that could make an enormous difference, and that is to take the appointment of Supreme Court justices, and maybe all federal judges, away from political actors. Um, mo many, many countries now have moved away from um, parliamentary, presidential appointment, and have gone to commissions, and that includes uh, the UK. 
The UK Supreme Court is selected by judges and lawyers serving on commissions. Um, some of the commissions, there's a two-thirds vote. So if you have a two-party system, it's got to be a consensus candidate. And the research has shown the obvious. The more political actors involved in a process, the more political the court. You, you know, look at our process. We have 101 political actors involved, the senators and the president. But when you have a commission, it's not perfect. No selection system is perfect. But you tend to get less political judges. And, you know, we would have to amend the Constitution to do that. And that's a big, big ask in this divided country. But if I had one reform, that would be it. What's your thought on that? Uh, I agree with uh, uh, what Lee says about what the political science literature shows. <clears throat> uh, I think that uh, uh, it would be, you know, there are dangers in uh, uh, the legal system becoming a self-perpetuating priesthood that I uh, have reservations about. And uh, so um, if, if I had a reform, I would probably go for um, uh, term limits of some sort. Uh, but as Lee says, that would require a constitutional amendment, and so that's not going to happen either. Um, it's 6.10 now. At around 6.15, I'm going to ask uh, anyone who has questions to come up to the microphone. Now, this is being broadcast on the Internet, so you have to ask questions from the microphone, please. Um, and so we'll turn to the audience if you have questions in just a few minutes. Um, but before we get to that, I would like to ask kind of an open-ended question, um, and that is, does political, I mean, does public opinion matter uh, for the Supreme Court? I mean, I mean, part of the, 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 the Supreme Court, they're not supposed to at least, you know, think about, well, what's the majority view and necessarily uh, decide that way because there, uh, after all, there is text of the Constitution, there are amendments that need to be enforced. Um, so is it proper for the court to consider what the public reaction will be, or is it necessary for the court uh, and, and individual members to vote based on what they intensely believe the text of the, of the Constitution says, or the statute, or the, the common law doctrine? What do you think? Well, maybe I'll let Rogers handle the normative part of that. We can come back. I mean, as an empirical matter, the data used to show that Supreme Court justices did consider public opinion um, they are the public. I mean, it, it's very hard to know from a data perspective, is public opinion influencing the justices or are they just part of the public, right? And experience war or economic crises or the indictment of a sitting, uh, of a former president in the same way that we do. It's, it's very hard to distinguish. What I see today though in the data and my own sense of it is, this goes back to your Federalist Society question, that the justices, they play to their own constituencies now. They live in their own echo chambers like we all do. You know, Sonia Sotomayor, she speaks all over the country, but she's not at the Federalist Society, right? And um, Justice Alito, he's always at the Federalist Society. He walks in the door, in his tuxedo, and everybody leaps up and claps. And so they're getting, they're getting um, the sense of their community, not the bigger community, and I don't know if that's so good. <laughs> well, I certainly agree with that, and uh, uh, I'll elaborate um, uh, that as Lee has indicated, you know, there was a study in the uh, National Academy of Sciences Journal uh, last year, which showed that um, uh, while there was still a swing justice uh, from 2010 up to 2020, uh, the Supreme Court did stay pretty close to median public opinion on the major constitutional issues it decided. <coughs> but since 2020, uh, with uh, the uh, appointment of uh, the third just Trump justice, um, Amy Coney Barrett, uh, the court has swung away from median public opinion and are now um, pretty squarely on 
median Republican voter opinion. So it's moved to become even more partisan aligned. Um, and uh, uh, whether or not you think public opinion should be taken into account, um, uh, simply taking into account part of public opinion doesn't seem very desirable. Now, in the jurisprudential question, um, <coughs> legal process theory says, uh, yes, it is appropriate to take contemporary public opinion into account in trying to figure out how the law can achieve its uh, purposes. Um, uh, originalist jurisprudence says, no, don't pay any attention uh, to uh, contemporary public opinion. Um, you can choose between those two camps. I'd note that um, uh, uh, John Marshall, uh, and I've already suggested, um, I'm not always charmed by his legal reasoning, but uh, John Marshall did similarly argue that you interpret the Constitution so that its great purposes, its great objects will be achieved. And if you think that constitutional interpretation should try to see that the Constitution accomplishes what it's authorized to accomplish, uh, then I think some attention uh, to public opinion is uh, appropriate. If you interpret it in a way that the Constitution uh, will fail, that's not uh, good judgment. Uh, but again, if public opinion is divided, probably you shouldn't pick sides. Now, coming from uh, the state court system, and in particular, a state court system in which judges are elected, uh, that question has maybe different ramifications because, you know, if you're elected, public opinion um, matters very dramatically because the ballot box can change who's in office. Um, and I say matters. Um, I think it shouldn't even then. And, and I mean, I think the job of the judge is uh, to determine to his or, or her best ability what the statute says, what the Constitution means, no matter what the impact would be, um, uh, you know, in the, in the public domain. Um, but you, but it's in the back of your, but it's in the back of your mind. And I completely agree that now there are these echo chambers and that's a problem. I, mean, I think it's a problem on both sides. Um, and if, if I could lay down a rule, it would be stop going to these advocacy organizations and speaking and just do the job. You, you're not there to be a celebrity, um, but there to answer these great legal you know, questions. Uh, and you have discretionary review, which means you can, you can let matters percolate um, and see where they come out. You, there's no reason in every single case to take on the dramatic, you know, uh, and, and take on a dramatic case and make an answer uh, to that. Um, <clears throat> Well, what about if, if, the, if things are not working exactly as maybe they should or maybe the framers thought they should, maybe it's time for a constitutional convention. And there have been um, efforts uh, to, to do that. Um, and, uh, and I'll tell you, I've heard, uh, not that I'm in these circles a lot, um, but there, the leadership on the, con the it, this has been a conservative movement for the most part. Um, and there's been uh, conservative leaders in both the House and Senate that don't want any part of that because of the chaos it might cause. But let's just talk about, you know, we're, we're, you're professors, you, talk, you think about theory. Um, is there any way in which a, a convention uh, could make our, our republic stronger? Lee. You know, <laughs> the, my first thought was my second slide showing the ideological gap between the senators, uh, the Republicans and the Democrats, and then the third slide showing what Republicans and Democrats think of each other. It, how's that gonna work? Maybe Rogers has a better answer. It just seems like, boy, there'll be food fights or something. Yeah, it's hard to see how this is a time in which a constitutional convention uh, would be productive. Uh, for the American people. So um, I don't see it as a, a plausible uh, scenario. I note that uh, the senator from my home state when I was growing up, Everett Dirksen, pushed for a constitutional convention and came within a couple of states of getting one called. 
Uh, and uh, I've always regarded it as uh, we dodged a bullet because Ev failed. So. If you have questions, um, please come up to the, uh, to the microphone um, and let's, let's uh, continue this dialogue. Now, uh, we talked about the two constitutions. Do you think there is a third emerging? Or are we in, is it always going to be this sort of polar relationship, this originalist versus um, living constitution, and that's where the, the, the uh, pendulum is going to be for all time, Rogers? Uh, I don't see a third constitution, uh, I don't see the clear outlines of a third constitution emerging uh, at this time, uh, but I also uh, uh, think that uh, change is inevitable. And, uh, you know, the point I ended with uh, is one that I hope advocates of living constitutionalism uh, will take seriously uh, because the truth is that the left perspectives on the Constitution uh, have moved uh, in such a critical direction uh, that they don't really offer any positive vision of constitutionalism uh, around which most Americans can align themselves. Um, so I think there is a real challenge uh, for those uh, who do want to see the Constitution as a document that structures powers and purposes and what they take to be a progressive direction uh, to try to uh, focus uh, much more extensively on the elements in the Constitution uh, that they can uh, legitimately embrace and endorse. Uh, my colleague at the University of Pennsylvania, Kermit Roosevelt, uh, has just published a book calling for more attention to the Reconstruction Amendments and uh, uh, the 14th Amendment in particular, um, uh, which <coughs> is uh, the uh, most important of the Reconstruction Amendments in many respects, and uh, trying to build constitutionalism uh, around that understanding of American powers and purposes. I think uh, that kind of reconstruction constitution might be a promising vision to build on. You know, I agree with that. You know, but I would also throw this out to all of you. If you look at kind of polls or surveys of historians and law professors of the great judges, you know, setting aside Marshall, because he's always number one, who do we have? We have Holmes, we have Harlan, we have Jackson. We have judges who really didn't subscribe to a methodology of law. They were judges. They used their judgment. Um, they had some judicial self-restraint elements to them. Uh, but I, this whole methodology thing is, on both sides, is distorting. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot. Uh, come on up to the microphone. It, uh, let's have your question first. Yeah, so I have a question. It's inspired by Professor Epstein's work, but I think all three of you um, could comment a bit. Um, and so, you know, when I look at Professor Epstein's data, and it's also based on what's possible, what's in front of the court, even though lots of things are. So how does the greater politicization of state Supreme Courts I'm thinking today there's the election in Wisconsin, yeah. which is going to tip the balance there. It's the, the most expensive can't, you know, um, judicial election ever anywhere. Um, we have the Supreme Court of uh, North Carolina that's tipped from liberal to Republican. They've already said it's open season for anything. And so, you know, so the Supreme Court can only act when there are legitimate things for it to act on. So is, is the expectation then, given what we're seeing at the states, that it's going to, you know, your trends are probably going to increase, given that many of the cases seem um, very partisan or ideological that they're even getting in the first place? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, we have a chief judge here who probably could speak to that better than I. I, I will give you a very quick answer from some research I'm doing now. Have you all heard about this independent state legislature theory? Question. Okay, so this is the idea of essentially uh, taking um, electoral matters away, and voting matters away from the state courts, and they would go to the federal courts. And it's, um, 
as, as uh, Michael Ludwig, no liberal, <laughs> has said, this is a Republican plot. And you kind of have to ask yourself, why are the Republicans plotting to take power away from state Supreme Courts? You know, you look at what happened in North Carolina. And what my data are showing are pretty interesting. I'd love to get your reaction is that when it comes to electoral matters, even conservative Republican courts are very generous to the voters. Duh, you know, <laughs> they're elected. And the voters like to vote. But the federal courts, uh, the Supreme Court in particular, has not been an especially democracy protecting court. So it's starting to make sense to me yeah, the state courts, you know, they're going to be political and the conservative courts will uphold abortion restrictions and so on. But when it comes to a big issue that we care about, it seems to me that the state courts, or at least the data are telling me, are more democracy protecting. I would love your views on this. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't know if that's, I don't know if I'd agree with that. I think um, the, the, I think the incentive for many, including state courts, is to maintain power. Um, and if the, the way that the voting process works keeps you in office, then, then that's good. Um, and so, so there are questions right now that are uh, being debated in a lot of courts, including uh, a lot of states, including Texas, and that is um, the extent of the suffrage. Um, you know, how many people have access to the polls? Do college students get to vote in, on college campuses versus at home? And what impact does that have on the vote? And, uh, you know, I, my, my suspicion is that the conservative-leaning legislation will be upheld in conservative courts, even if it is somewhat restrictive on voting rights. I just think that's... Um, that's where we are. And the other interesting thing in North Carolina is, yeah, Moore versus Harper's, the case that she's talking about, is up there at the court. It's, it was argued, very interesting argument. It's wonderful to go back and you can do this now, read the transcripts, listen to the argument uh, and the back and forth. But since the Supreme Court has shifted from, uh, I don't know if they're partisan there, but from the liberal to the conservative, the, the new court has said, we're going to reconsider uh, what our former colleagues have, have said on, in, in, with respect to whether the redistricting was constitutional under state law or not. And so that case, I think, is probably going to be moot yeah. at the U.S. Supreme Court, and we'll have to wait for another iteration to come uh, for, to, that, to that court. Um, I agree go ahead. with that. I, I would just say, for me, it's a comparative matter, right? So under this independent state legislature, I hate calling it a theory. It made up idea it is more like it. Um, it, it, it um, it's a comparison between the federal courts and ultimately the Supreme Court and the state Supreme Court. And the state Supreme Courts are coming out better in that comparison. Yeah. That's the, the interesting feature of this. Yes, and, the, and you might, if you're interested in this area, the Conference of Chief Justices submitted an amicus they brief did. that put uh, forth sort of that position of the state courts. But while we're talking about current issues at the Supreme Court, I'm going to put you on, uh, on the spot here uh, because there is an affirmative action case that was um, argued uh, at the court. There are actually two cases, uh, one of which uh, Katanji Brown Jackson is recused from involving Harvard. But do you have any predictions or uh, thoughts about how those cases are going to come out? Yes, I think that uh, the court will overturn the constitutionality of affirmative action. Um, this is a case, uh, you know, where uh, Chief Justice John Roberts, where, who, as I've indicated, um, is an institutionalist, cautious about overturning precedents, but he's also the guy who wrote um, uh, uh, that the only way to um, uh, stop uh, discriminating, on the, discriminating on the basis of race is to stop mm -hmm. discriminating race. on the basis of race. And so I think uh, you'll get a conservative supermajority uh, in the Harvard and North Carolina cases. I think so too. Professor Zinman. Yeah, I uh, have a question which is probably unanswerable, but I, I'd like, I'm, I'm a bit, I'm a bit, 
I'm a bit uncertain uh, about the fundamental cause or causes of our present dilemma on the basis of what everyone has been talking about. I mean, there seems to be general agreement about what the problem is. Um, and it's not clear to me why things are different now to the extent that uh, we are talking as if we are faced with a, somehow a new problem. I'm not denying it's a new problem. But it's not clear to me, if it is a new problem, why it's new, or what the cause of its newness is. So let me just, general statement. As far as I can tell, in a liberal democracy with a written constitution, like the United States, there are going to be parties. There's going to be a party system. In American history, as far as I can tell, from the beginning, even prior to the ratification of the Constitution, the parties necessarily, in part, understood themselves and presented themselves as having different interpretations of the Constitution. I mean, that's one of the things that made them the parties that they were. That seems to me to be an inevitable feature of liberal democratic government, at least when there is a written Constitution. So if that's the case, one would expect uh, partisanship to infect the judiciary to one degree or another in any such regime and at any time within the history of that regime. So what is different now? I'm not, I'm, uh, for example, uh, Rogers seems to suggest that perhaps the fundamental difference is the rise of progressivism. But I'm not sure that th that in itself is enough of an explanation. And if it, if it is, then should we just blame progressivism for our present uh, uh, dilemma? I'm sure Rogers wouldn't. Um, and Rogers rightly understands the present constitution to be a hybrid. So what exactly is the cause or the fundamental cause or cause of our dilemma? Uh, Rogers seemed to say at the end, the cause is us. And I, I tend to agree with that. But if it's true, if it's us, in other words, if it's in our hands uh, to somehow effectively deal with this problem. What's wrong with us now? Rogers? Yeah. What's wrong with us? Well, the, uh, as Lee noted, political scientists have struggled to identify the causes of our current deep polarization and have failed to come out up with any really definitive account. Um, and I don't have one either. Uh, there is a common uh, family of explanations, uh, which I think do have force, uh, that point uh, both to economic policies shared by leaders in both parties in this country and many countries uh, that have, over their, uh, the past generation, uh, contributed to heightening economic inequalities in a sense of many uh, uh, more traditional Americans that, um, uh, uh, and less educated uh, Americans, that their economic interests are not taken seriously, <coughs> excuse me, by government elites. And I think there's been truth to that. There's also a family of cultural explanations, uh, which say that the uh, transformations, uh, demographically, uh, religiously, um, and uh, in terms of uh, uh, prevailing uh, mores uh, threatening culturally traditional Americans has led to a deeper sense of alienation that feeds into the polarization, that feeds into all politics, that feeds into the polarization of the courts. To tie it back to the Constitution, I would say that uh, we did begin as a uh, 
country created by a coalition of um, propertied white Christian men that uh, designed a uh, system displacing the indigenous population, as noted in the opening acknowledgement, um, uh, in ways uh, that created vested interests in many kinds of traditional uh, cultural forms and hierarchies and structures of power. They simultaneously embraced a set of principles that could and would be used to challenge many of those traditional, uh, uh, that traditional coalition's privileges and powers and hierarchies. And in the course of the evolution of progressivism, which at the beginning of the century didn't challenge many of those hierarchies, it came to do so. Uh, and in a sense, uh, the uh, uh, tensions uh, between the actual coalition and the vested interests and the aspirations, uh, uh, the proclamations of a project to secure rights of all, uh, have now come into sharper collision in our time than uh, at any time in our past except the 1850s. Uh, and consequently, uh, we have a crisis of division that is in some respects comparable to that period. What's your thought? You know, the only thing I would add about that is that these divisions are playing out all over the world. No. You know, so what, what, what is it um, and maybe it's just, maybe the answer is some version of income inequity everywhere. But I, I think we have to say we're not exceptional in this regard. I mean, they may be more severe here than other places, but look what just happened in Israel. Yeah. Yes. Do we have time? Yes. Yeah, so I, I want to uh, ask, um, two hopefully quick questions. The first is one institution that would seem to have a great deal of influence in the future cor uh, course of, of events in this domain are the law schools. Um, and when you review, I don't know, the last half century or more of, um, of judicial behavior, Supreme Court behavior, you see a kind of generational oscillation that is on a kind of time lag, you almost, uh, the, the a generation that, that, that comes to maturity in their understanding of the law um, under one regime uh, is, is moved to respond or correct. Um, Dr. Epstein, I'd be interested in hearing from you, you know, what's the situation on the ground at law schools and can we hope for a kind of uh, predictable corrective uh, in the direction of something like institutional responsibility there? Um, can I sneak a second question in sure. uh, uh, following that? So then the second question goes like this. You know, we've grown used to, a, to an understanding of our Constitution whereby the Supreme Court is the primary um, responsible party safeguarding um, of the integrity of the institutional structure and separation of powers altogether. All um, but this doesn't necessarily, it's not even clear to me that this was the founder's understanding of, um, of, of uh, the question of who was responsible for maintaining uh, the separation of powers. All the branches of government share that responsibility. And here's, here's a thought that I have. Um, the, the, the need, the imperative for Supreme Court justices to behave in an institutionally responsible fashion could become more manifest if they saw greater reluctance on the part of either the executive or the legislative branch to abide by their decisions, right? So, um, for example, consider um, Andrew Jackson's refusal, <laughs> famously, uh, of, a, of a Supreme Court decision, or consider a legislature that repeatedly in the face of a, of a opposition from a uh, a, 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 a Supreme Court um, sends back precisely the same legislation uh, uh, unfazed by it. Is there any hope that um, the, the need, uh, be, because after all, the, the, the Supreme Court's legitimacy is, I mean, they have, they have nothing but their words and their status, as it were, to carry the day. Um, could they be brought back to a kind of institutional responsibility by such, uh, such events? Thank you. And uh, this has been a fantastic discussion. I'm very grateful to you. Lee, the first question was to you. Look, 
I think I, I, I've taught at three law schools, uh, Northwestern, Washington U, and USC. And I don't think law schools do a particularly good job preparing law students to be citizens of the world. They just don't. And if you look, just any day of the week, open a newspaper, you will see some problem at some law school. This week at Stanford Law School where there was a problem with a judge who came and, and the students were heckling him. I will say he heck, heck, heckled those students too, but you know, mm -hmm. the students heckled him and it wasn't right and it's happened at Yale and it's happened everywhere. I think one answer is to start having courses, if you just, if we just had courses on free speech on campus, if you will, if you can narrow it, but to try to get students to understand the value of dialogue. Um, we've been teaching a course like that to undergrads and I think it's amazingly effective in helping them to think about the kind of university and ultimately the kind of world they want to live in, they want to curate, help curate. And I think the law schools need to start thinking about this because uh, most of them are just echo chambers. They really are, and we have to break that. There was an, an article, I can't remember the author's name, it was in the New York Times, I think today. Um, and this uh, professor was recounting, uh, she came from a liberal perspective, and she was recounting the, the day Scalia came on campus and, and was debating. And, and she was saying that she had so internalized her view that she had you know, sort of not listened to the other side. And when she started listening, she was almost angry that he was so good <laughs> at expressing the other side. And it, and, it, and it said to her, we need to listen more. And, and th those that are shutting down speech are really doing a disservice to themselves and I think uh, I think it was in today's, and I, and I agreed with that perspective, and, and I hope that's uh, true in law schools. And, and, and it's also, I, I'll say this, and I'm, maybe I'll go out on the line here. Um, the, the, when the liberal groups um, denigrate, you know, conservative thinking as completely, you know, you can't, one of my professors was a guy named Lino Gralia at the University of Texas Law School, and he wrote a book that was very critical of uh, the affirmative action Supreme Court holdings and, and all of that. Uh, and I took his class and, you know, uh, and, and I found him very engaging and he was very right about a whole lot uh, of what he was saying. And it, very critical, the critical analysis and what was the debates in, and, and I thought in, in 1964 in the Civil Rights Act, and I thought those helped me uh, become a better lawyer. I mean, listening to that engaging with him, going to his office, and asking him, well, what about Brown versus Board of Education? And, you know, and, and, and really just starting to talk about these things. Uh, so I think the, the very uh, loud denouncement of uh, the other side is not helpful, uh, in my opinion, and engagement is, um, is where we should be. But that's my, my own personal. We should, um, we should make John Stuart Mill on Liberty required reading. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, what about the idea that if the Supreme Court they, it doesn't have the, the, the sword, you know, it only has the power of the pen, um, the question was, well, what about legislat legislatures, people, institutions defying uh, pronouncements and, and maybe using that as a way to recalibrate where they are? And what do you think about that? Well, that's very much a version of what I was suggesting. And uh, uh, I don't think that um, we should have widespread disobedience of the specific results in particular cases. Um, uh, I don't think it's diplomatic to pass exactly the same law, but I do think it's appropriate to pass very similar laws that require them to reconsider their earlier opinions, and I agree we should be more assertive in doing so uh, than we are right now. Um, Rocky, uh, you let me know when we need to wrap this up, but there's a, a question at the microphone, so please go ahead. Please. Uh, yeah, first of all, I want to thank you all for coming today. Uh, I appreciate it, and I appreciate uh, Professor Epstein, Professor Smith's uh, 
lectures and slides, so they're very informative. Uh, I guess to continue on with the question of dialogue and how useful that could be for plaintiffs, uh, for plaintiffs in constructing their arguments to the Supreme Court, would it be beneficial for them to play into the analysis that uh, Thomas had in his concurring opinion in McDonald, in Washington v. McDonald, and that they could maybe bring up the P and I clause as a substitute for substantive due process rights in these cases that Thomas is also citing as something that the court should look at in his concurring opinion for Dobbs as a different legal tool for anal analyzing what what their place is. Thank you. Mark? I, you know, the, there have been efforts to revive the Privileges and Immunities Clause ever since the Slaughterhouse cases read them so narrowly. Um, I've always been in favor of those efforts, and I'd note that John Paul Stevens, when he was on the court, had some success in getting new attention to the Privileges and Immunities Clause. It has limitations, um, uh, especially uh, uh, for many liberals because it is confined to rights of citizens and not persons, uh, but at the same time, it is a more plausible basis uh, for many decisions uh, than the due process clauses. And uh, while all the efforts to revive it in the past have failed, uh, it is imaginable that you could get a coalition of more liberal and more conservative uh, justices now uh, to breathe some new life in the Privileges and Immunities Clause and if so, um, in my view, it might produce a more coherent jurisprudence in many issues. There's also, you know, there, there are 50 states and territories and, and they have their own constitutions. Um, and, and today there's a um, new effort to litigate in those courts some of these great questions of the day that don't have a federal supremacy, you know, um, uh, hammer. Uh, so that's one way to think about, you know, litigating um, these questions in different laboratories and seeing how they come out. Yes. Yeah, so um, I kind of wanted to take you guys back to, to the question you asked kind of at the start of the Q&A about uh, a third view of the Constitution. Um, I was reading an article lately about, about a very controversial book that was published, and, and to be clear, I don't support this view of the Constitution, called Common Good Constitutionalism by Adrian Vermeule. Um, uh, and uh, essentially my understanding of it is, is he wants to abandon positivistic readings of, of uh, the law and um, go towards some conception of the common good that you know, he defines through like uh, uh, Catholic natural law theories. Um, and I guess my question becomes, uh, uh, I, I know that this um, theory is a fairly fringe theory at the moment, but it is gaining momentum in law schools I know there, there, there have been various law school conferences surrounding these kinds of theories. So uh, how likely are we, given the uh, partisan divisions in the courts today, to be um, seeing uh, these more ideologically charged interpretations of the Constitution and these more explicitly ideological interpretations of the Constitution come into vogue in the courts today? Lee? Well, I think you're asking the wrong, I, I think I'm the wrong person to answer it because I don't think any of these theories make any difference. I think they're just, you know, methods that I think, I think the judges know, the justices on the Supreme Court, I'll talk about them, I think they know how they want the case to come out, they'll find some method that can justify it, and, you know, they'll cherry pick the evidence to support that interpretation. So, I, you know, my view is um, they'll latch on to any theory that will help them get to the results they want. They want. So I'm, you know, I'm not a big fan of all these methodologies. I would um, uh, differ with that to a limited extent. If we talk about uh, methodologies of judicial interpretation, I agree. They are neither binding nor are they ever consistently employed by judges. And in fact, in my latter years teaching constitutional law courses, I just dropped them because I didn't really think that they illuminated anything that was actually happening. However, originalism, living constitutionalism, are labels for substantive visions of the Constitution that are very different. Fair enough. And, and uh, uh, you know, when you say they'll use any method to get to what they want, these help define what they want, these substantive visions. That's a nice point. Um, and, uh, 
Adrian uh, Vermeerly has, you're quite right, a Catholic natural law vision of the Constitution. I think it's preposterous as a matter of constitutional interpretation, and he doesn't really present it as such. He just thinks it's what's objectively true and good, so let's do what's objectively true and good in his view. I would have said that it had no chance to be taken seriously if we didn't have this highly Catholic Supreme Court. Uh, but um, it's now uh, remotely plausible that they'll embrace some of these common good constitutional um, arguments. Uh, I think uh, that is highly regrettable, though, uh, because um, it really does uh, amount to uh, a version of saying uh, that constitutional interpretation is simply reading into it whatever I think is right. Thank you very much. Well, this has been a, a very um, uh, thoughtful presentation by my colleagues here uh, and great questions from the audience. Um, the one thing I would say is, you know, it's, it, we're not on the Supreme Court, but we have an obligation to watch uh, ourselves um, and to the extent uh, we can to read the briefs, you know, and listen to the arguments and see what's going on there. There will be, you know, over time more vacancies and then more debates on how to fill them or not to fill them. And in the end, we, you know, we the people uh, have a say. And, and the say is at the, at the ballot box. It's talking to our senators in Congress. It's writing. It's teaching. Um, and it's, uh, in a way, the way our uh, to me, our society works um, compared to other. Uh, we, we have the freedom to get out there and speak, and, and it's a strength um, of where we find ourselves today and one of the enduring aspects of our, of our republic. So uh, I want to, again, thank my colleagues um, and thank uh, Professor Painter who made this lecture possible, and thank you for being here. Thank you all. Dean, you have any? And I, so we're we're adjourned. Thanks so much. <laughs> Courtroom's adjourned. <laughs> Thank you. Great job. Oh, that was wonderful.